All right. Heavenly Father, I just want to pause before we ever dive into your word. I always want to pause and just give you thanks for every word, every every dot, every cross T. Uh, Lord, I take this as a moment of time where we can be refilled with your truth and be realigned with your truth because I just can't find much of anything in this earth and this this little existence that uh, that is true other than your word. And so how amazing is it that you've plopped this thing right in our lap for us to digest and, and uh, to, to look at with a magnifying glass. And hopefully something I say today would spark a revelation of discipleship, not just a good factoid or not just a historical, interesting um, piece, but it would lead into sanctification. Ultimately, it's that big word that we never talk about, but Lord, I just want to offer our lives up as a sacrifice of praise and offering and worship to you. And may our conversation and the, the words that I say here today be pleasing to you as a song of praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, good to see you guys on Zoom. It's good to see you guys here. Good to see um, some people bringing their lunch. I would like to have uh, that sandwich over here. Uh, if anybody else wants to share today, that's great. Uh, no, that's okay. I brought my lunch. You guys are, are in for a, a fun day today I, I always say today's the best day because it's always the best day whenever you get to open up the bible but today's a fun one because we turn a corner in Acts 16 we turn a corner because we kind of jump into Paul's second second missionary journey and we kind of dive into a new section of Acts that actually culminates through the chapter 16 it culminates through chapter 19 it's this cool theater, it's this cool story, uh, a narrative of how the entire nation uh, of, of Europe was reached. It's the story of how all of Asia Minor was reached for the gospel. And we see some crazy stuff. We see a demoniac, we see uh, some, some, uh, some traveling that meets uh, where they meet some interesting characters. And so I can't wait to dive in with you guys today. But just to kind of a little bit of a review... We got the last verse of chapter 15. Paul selected his next traveling partner. What was his name? A little Bible trivia. What was his name? Silas. Silas. He departs on his second missionary journey. The final verse, we kind of see that he headed north. He headed north on a trajectory. I got my little slides here. And if you guys have your maps, I do uh, have a new map to look at today. Uh, and it's kind of like important to know, I don't know about you guys, but I don't like reading the book of Acts without a map next to me. I really can't understand the words and the, and the, 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 the city names. You can't Google search most of these today. And so it's really difficult to see it in your head. It really helps to, to dispel all of those silly notions in your head of where we're talking about if you have a map next to you. So I can't encourage that enough. So there's a lot of cool resources. I have one for you guys today up here on the screen. But if you're listening, Google search uh, Paul's second missionary journey. Well, he he heads up. Remember, we were, we were just in the Council of Jerusalem, and they have a letter that they're trying to get back to the churches saying, you do not have to be circumcised. Good news, right? Big good news. And Paul and his buddy Barnabas and a few others are headed up through Syria, up to Antioch. He first passes his first pass. Uh, he actually goes through Syria and then Cilicia, so he actually heads clear up here. So remember, Cilicia is here and Syria is here, and he's heading back up north. So get that in your head. And Cilicia was next to and included Paul's hometown, which is what Tarsus. So Tarsus is right here. This is where Paul grew up. He spent uh, most of his life there. And so this was common ground. It'd be like you going home to the old farm. So obviously he passed through his old hometown. And honestly, Barnabas uh, was actually born and raised in this area of Syria right here. So we have a, an interesting little piece of information that Barnabas gets jettisoned. He actually leaves the party. Paul no longer travels with Barnabas, and it's pretty much a solid 98% uh, certainty that Barnabas obviously just dropped off at his old hometown. It's not like he's just going to just go to some random spot. So it can be 
pretty much uh, for sure thing that he ended up, it's it's not a big mountaintop uh, uh, a hill to die on, but it can be speculated that he just went back to his own hometown. So then Cilicia was next, and his town, Paul's hometown of Tarsus, would have been right there. So the stated purpose, can anybody tell me what the purpose of the trip was? Spread the gospel, okay, Larry, that's, that's the easy one, but... Uh, but uh, Jesus, yeah. what what was that? The, second. the second missionary journey. What was one of the purpose? What was the big purpose behind it? Yes, you got it. What was it? Yes, strengthen the churches with the message that they got from Jerusalem. So they got this little this little sealed letter that they're supposed to read, and once they read it, it says things like, "You don't got to be circumcised." And everybody shouts and says, yes, I'm so glad I don't have to be. Well, uh, of course, Paul continues to evangelize as he moves. Paul can't not evangelize. You know what I'm saying? As, as we start the journey in chapter 16 today, we're going to notice Paul picks up another traveler. Can somebody pull out their scripture and read nice and loud 16, 1 through 3? Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And Here it is. Traveled... That's good. That's good. <laughs> all right. So verse 3 there. Let's just push pause for a second. So let's take in a little bit of what this just said. After Tarsus, Paul moves westward among the Med Sea, Mediterranean, towards uh, the churches that he planted. Do you guys remember this? I mean, maybe you guys were part of this session or not, but this is a, an interesting take on... Uh, oh my goodness, I'm having so many issues with my slides here. Uh, this is an interesting thing because he's backtracking where he came from before. So remember, he came from Cyprus, and he, he did this little number like this. Well, now he's coming back through Derby, Lystra, and Iconium. Well, do you guys remember Derby and Lystra? What's some specific things? This is, this is Bible trivia week, I guess. But what are some of the, what's something interesting that happened in Lystra to Paul? He was worshipped like a god. Which God? Bonus points. Who, who was it? Pluto. Yep. So we have, we got a zoo. We had Barnabas there calling Zeus. Remember? And then you got his, you got little Paul. That's why we think maybe Paul was a little stocky guy. But, but we basically see this as a city that they came back to. He came back to. And the last thing he knew was in Lystra, they were worshiping him as a god. What happened to him in Derby? He got a baseball to the head, right? Uh, he got stoned. He actually got thrown down. They thought he was dead. Guys, that just was a few years before. And now he's coming back with a letter to encourage those believers in those cities. In Lystra, uh, Paul encounters a young believer named Timothy. Uh, Timothy was a son of a mixed marriage. We know a lot about Timothy for some reason. But some of the, the details include that he was in a mixed marriage, which means his mom was Jewish and his dad was Greek, a Gentile. Oh, no. And Timothy had a good testimony, it says, among the brethren in the region. That's an interesting thing to think about, that it's noted in Scripture, and Luke felt the need to include that little detail about our guy named Timothy. He had a good reputation. He was, he was uh, known to have good character. And as a result, Paul decides he wants Timothy to accompany him from this point forward. Interesting side note. Do you see that there is a subtext in the back of Paul's mind the entire time, if you see how far we've come? What's one of those things? That he is always, always, always looking to reproduce himself. He's looking for a successor. 
a apprentice. A, and guess what? He was a tent maker. So every good tradesman out there listening to me knows that you aren't going to be around much longer. I mean, 80 years is a long time to us, but you better year one, better start thinking about your replacement program if you want your company to continue on. A good tradesman understands this, that you've got to let the young generation back in there. And I think that's a, a, an interesting little side note that I just wanted to interject there. So he sees this young man named Timothy, and he goes, you are of good character. Huh. Character was and is always the first test for suitability in service in Scripture. Did you know that? To the Lord, this is the primary suitability test. And in this moment, this is no exception. Even before Timothy was taught or mature enough for service, Paul evaluated his character. You see that? That's an interesting thing that just stood out to me like a red flag. Before Timothy was ever a big thing, or a big name, or up on a stage, or had a big ministry, or a YouTube channel, <laughs> he was evaluated by Paul with one credential, character. And with a good testimony, Paul decides... He was an eligible partner in his ministry. So often, we get this completely backwards. Completely backwards in our churches today. Timothy is a notable character in the New Testament. Two of only four books of the New Testament names for someone other than the author. You guys see that? So Timothy actually gets placed in the, in the notes a lot. And it was always about his character. Let me ask you guys, what's your rubric for the eligibility to be a leader or in service with you as you serve the Lord? What's your what's your lens? What what's the what's the tick? What's the checkbox? What are you looking for? Pedigree, income, maybe their last name. Maybe their notoriety on uh, on social media. How many likes they have? How many streams they have? How many people think they're cool? <laughs> no. You don't see that in Scripture. However, you do see it in the, today's society as the thing. As the thing. The number one thing in our politics, namely, in our churches, in our government, in our businesses... I just want to have you guys take a little inventory of what you personally look for when it comes to reproducing yourself and passing it on to the next generation and raising up the next generation in skills and abilities and ministry. From those two books, these two books, Timothy, First and Second Timothy, those two books written by Paul, we can learn much more about Timothy. So if you guys want to go ahead and read those next week, this week, I would invite you to do so. But I got some, I did some of that work this week. Here's a couple crazy little tidbits. <laughs> Lystra was Timothy's home. Lystra was Timothy's home. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1-2 that he led Timothy to Jesus when he was there the first time. So little old Timothy was, you know, they, they speculate maybe he was 10, 12 years old, 14. Paul led him to the Lord. He was the one that was able to, to be there as an instrument of the gospel of Jesus for Timothy. Timothy was taught to study scripture from an early age by his Jewish mother, Eunice. His mom's name was Eunice, and she was Jewish. She taught him to read the Old Testament like a good mom would if you're Jewish. You need to read those first five books of the Bible, Timothy. Of course, they didn't call it the Bible back then. It was called the law. And guys, the Torah is, is still a thing that you have to memorize if you're a Jewish little, a 10-year-old Jewish boy. You have to memorize those entire, in the entirety of it. 
good luck with you uh, Gentiles out there listening. I don't know that you guys could ever, <laughs> I don't know that I could ever memorize the first five books of the Bible. It might take me a couple of years, but they start them young. So here's Timothy memorizing scripture. So scripture is at the centerpiece of his everyday life, like a good Jewish boy would. Um, he was also raised up, uh, uh, he had a Jewish grandmother named Lois. I think that's such a, uh, a a fun old old name like Lois. Uh, that's such a such a cool name. So her, his grandma was named Lois. We don't know anything about his Greek father's name or who he was, but Luke writes about him. I thought this was interesting in the past tense. What's that mean? He's probably dead. So he's gone or dead by this point. And as the son of a Greek. Timothy, I, Timothy's identity as a Jew was probably an extremely hush-hush, secret point of contention. This was especially true since Timothy had never been circumcised. Guys, if he's not, not circumcised, he's not a Jew. By Jewish law, this isn't something that man made up, by the way. This is in the, this is in the law. If you wanted to be a Jew, you must be circumcised. So, is he a Jew by the law standard? No, he's not a Jew, though he was raised a Jew. He is he is in a crossfire, as it will, as it were. He's stepped foot in both houses. He's caught in the middle, and now he gave his life to Jesus Christ. Now he's got a whole other thing to deal with. So Timothy was a young man and seemed to suffer from a nervous or weak stomach. Why do I know that? Paul advised Timothy to drink some wine every night rather than water. Why is that? Well, it helps his stomach, calms his stomach down. That's what Larry does every day. <laughs> no, no, a glass, not a bottle. No, yeah, good, good. <laughs> Two glasses? Okay, good, okay, good. One for her, yes. Yes, and, and and you guys know this, but water back then was hard to find, um, and and it did it calmed it was medicinal purposes, and so he advised Titus to hey listen take a little wine it's going to make your stomach feel a little bit better because Paul is planning to carry the gospel to Jews first. Remember, that's his mo. Did he come up with that? No, Jesus did. Jesus told Paul to do this. Well, now he's. He's in, a, he's in a holding pattern going, what do I do? If my first audience is Jew, first Jewish, first, then Gentile, he tells Timothy, you got to get circumcised. Sorry. As the text tell us, Timothy mixed, his mixed family roots were well known. He was well known in the community. And you guys... Uh, you guys are not even close to, like, this is a completely different culture. I mean, we are so far removed from any culture of Jewish uh, traditions as Gentiles. It's even hard, it's hard, so, it's so hard to find this context that I'm talking about relevant to you. But this was a big deal. This would, this would stop you from having a career. This would stop you from having relationships with specific people. The mixed marriage that was he was a part of was probably a little bit of a scandal. It was a little bit of a yah-yah in the local bars, in the, in the coffee shops. The old farmers were talking about it. You know, they were going, hey, do you hear about this, this little thing going on? And it's not exactly fully accepted among Jews. Timothy could have identified himself in either camp, couldn't he? He could have done one or the other. He could have remained uncircumcised and adopted a Greek heritage and renounced any claim of his Jewishness. But with his knowledge of the Jewish scriptures and his potential to assist Paul in Jewish evangelism, Paul persuaded Timothy to side with his Jewish roots. Okay? Yet, if Timothy were to be accepted by Jews as truly Orthodox Jewish, he would need to confirm to the to the Jewish the most Jewish of them all in a ritual called circumcision he's got to no way out 
In fact, if Timothy is to call himself Jewish, he must be circumcised according to the Mosaic law, according to the Abrahamic covenant. Excuse me. This goes clear back to the Abrahamic covenant. So Paul circumcises Timothy. The end. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. That is a very big statement right there that is very dramatic, but it's just one sentence. And then Paul took him and, and circumcised him. Paul circumcises Timothy prior to taking the trip so that the Jews in the area would receive both men as adequate, listen to me, Jewish representatives. What? What's going on here? You know, you have to ask yourself, why did they need to do that? Just a couple chapters before, what was going on? They got a letter in their hand that says, I don't got to do this. Do you guys see a dilemma? I kind of feel like I had a little problem with that in my gut this week. I kind of had a little, oh yeah, wait a minute. You know, us Americans always got to feel like we got an upper hand on this thing, don't we? This is a pointed example of Paul's own statement in 1 Corinthians 9.20. Write that down, 1 Corinthians 9.20. Paul is willing to become whoever and whatever he needed to be to win one person to Christ. I mean, talk about putting your money where your mouth is. I'm telling you, here is an example of Paul asking Timothy to do the same thing, to follow the same standard for the same gospel, for the sake of reaching the Jews for the gospel. Later, Paul will encounter another man named Titus. I named my middle child after that little guy. In Titus's case, Paul prohibits him to get circumcised. Crazy, right? Oh, no, you want to get circumcised? No, I forbid it. So what's what, what do I do here? What do I do with this? And you can imagine theologians, believers take all of this text as prescriptive instead of descriptive, and they go crazy. I mean, there's there's paradoxes all over the place. If you take this as prescriptive, good luck with that. That is going to be just going to lead you down some really strange paths. So Paul takes uh, this. Paul wanted to debunk their false teaching with Titus. You guys are back on Titus. It, with Titus's case, he wanted to debunk the false teaching, and since Titus was a Gentile, he had absolutely no reason to submit to circumcision. He wanted Titus to be able to speak to Gentiles and have complete credibility and complete authority and complete. Uh, it's it's a, again a good a good way of saying it is to be in context and be uh, in relevance to today's hearers. Are you subjecting yourself to uh, false doctrine? Absolutely not. But you're being sensitive to, to to today's culture and you're becoming a uh, you're becoming a herald to today's hearers. It's like me singing in King James and expecting my teenage kid to want to listen to it all the time. It's just going over his head. It's a very interesting thing that Paul was not caving to a doctrinal, non-Salvitic, false gospel. He was literally becoming all things so he could reach a few. Paul wanted to debunk that, so he, so he did that. The situation was very different, so Paul's demands were very different. And we see that here today. Somebody go ahead. Uh, by the way, just to make sure you guys know where I'm at. Circumcision is not required for salvation. Oh, I just wanted to make sure you guys are good with that. Okay, okay. Just making sure. And if you're driving right now, listening to the podcast, I hope you don't wreck your car. Uh, that is very, very much uh, been fulfilled in the cross of Christ. Somebody pick up their Bibles and read verse 4 through 5 is all. Two more verses. Somebody. While they were passing okay. through the cities, they were delivering... The ordinances for them to follow, which had been determined by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. So the churches were being strengthened in faith and were increasing in number daily. Thank you. So as Paul and Silas, back to Paul and our good old Saul and Pi, Saul, Paul and Silas, and now Timothy move on from Lystra. They deliver the decision of the Jerusalem Council. Remember, they had the Jerusalem Council letter specifically. 
the relief from following the law, but for the four restrictions asked by the Gentile, four of the Gentile believers. Remember what they were? You got to do some stuff to make sure that we're not becoming super dist dis uh, distasteful or let's, I even use the word gross, but off-putting to our Jewish brothers and sisters. So to have fellowship, can we ask you guys to just abstain from drinking blood, from eating strangled animals, from, do uh, you remember the dietary restrictions, and to practice these four things. Now, the ha they also bringing the good news, it's like a compliment sandwich. It's saying, hey, you guys don't got to get circumcised. Yay! But can you do these four things? There was a yay, but. So this is that letter that they had, right? And it was supposed to, remember, this is not salvitic. This is not leading to salvation. It's leading to more fellowship. That's a big point to take. Like, what leads to greater fellowship and the growth of the church? Specifically, this brought rejoicing all over again in each new location that they came two years prior. And it allowed the church to grow without hesitation. Notice the growth of churches. I want us, I want us, I want us to... I want us to talk about this. Church growth. It's a word. It's a word that goes through the halls of staff. If you've been on church as, as church staff, if you've been a part of a ministry as a volunteer, we're always in America, always looking for growing churches, right? And in the 80s, there was this big boom, you know, of mega churches and thousands of people packing into big brick and mortar buildings. Now we're up on this new era of, of sorts where we, we're on the, on the post, on the back heels of a church planting movement where it went from big extraction model to attraction model to uh, scatter. We got to plant more churches. Now we're in this strange uh, season, and I think every season is absolutely deliberate because of our sovereign God, but we are in a season of, wait a minute. What is this strategy called church growth? What is it? And I know that a lot of staff members are asking this question inside of their head. And I know a lot of pastors who are struggling with this inside of their head. We, you know, we just came through COVID. We had kind of a flight away from in person. We had Zoom calls. We had virtual church. So everybody's asking this question of what does growing the church look like? You know? So can I just have you guys take all of your Christianism, and I'm going to do the same, and we're going to set it up on a shelf for a second. And we're going to look at what Acts says right here. So this is what I took as two, only two, there's only two, indicators of a growing church, according to Paul. Let's take it from Paul's perspective. There's twofold, two things that are going to happen. The church will be strengthened spiritually Anytime the gospel is preached, anytime you'll see the, the Greek word actually means uh, strengthened. It actually means to be made stiff like a strong muscle. This is the, the, the indicator <clears throat> of church growth. A Christian being able to stand as a disciple of Christ on the word of God. And this is an indicator of a healthy church that's growing. It's the second one. You guys weren't ready for this one, I bet. Numeric, a measure of numeric growth. Did you notice I say a measure? I did not say a ton <laughs> or overwhelming or uncountable boom. No, a measure, some, a little or a lot, it doesn't usurp the idea that there might be thousands of people flocking to your church. But there is one thing that Scripture shows us, and it's there has to be, there will be, an indicator that can be trusted is a measure of numeric growth, meaning more people are being drawn by the Holy Spirit to then be discipled after being saved. Guys, this is a thing that very, very much gets mixed up in our culture right now, so I actually made a slide out of it. Our job is number two. Number one, stay out of that. 
That's none of your business. Guys, that's I'm being crude, but God does the saving. We do discipleship. This is sometimes amazing to watch, and we absolutely are involved, but we're just an instrument. It's like Nate back there. He's, it, we're like the trumpet in his hand. He's just blowing, he's blowing right through it, and you're just the brass. Yeah, yeah, you should, yeah. God does the saving. We need to be there for discipleship. Again, numeric growth and spiritually strong. This is a biblical concept. The church will grow numerically. The proclamation that salvation is by faith and not works will encourage growth. Just like when we said back here, no circumcision needed, they flocked to that church. We don't got to be circumcised to be saved. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Doing the Holy Ghost hop, you know, I can just see him, you know, doing the, doing the organ reprise, you know. This is a historical pattern even to today. When you go to a third world country, I don't know if you guys have ever been there, like in a situation like this, when you preach the gospel, it's a party. Only in the United States have I ever been a part of a ministry where I preach the gospel and I actually have persecution. I mean, you go to Haiti, like I was in Haiti, and, and you, you, you experience people are going, freedom from demonic bondage? I'm in. Of course, you have the enemy sitting there trying to take you down all at every uh, turn. But it's freedom. It's growth. It's just unabashed joy. But the preaching of the true gospel and sound doctrine will always strengthen the church in both of these ways. They always will. You can't preach the gospel and not be strengthened. I mean, I was talking to my bro brother Mike. He's been... Hearing into the scripture, he can't believe how much he's growing. It's not something he can control. It's like one plus one equals two. And the church will experience some measure of growth, but, oh, here comes the but. There are other methods. There are other ways to grow the church. And unfortunately, I've been a part of a lot of, a lot of those. And I, I don't blame anybody, but I want to just mention that in your life, have you been a part of a church growth strategy that has nothing to do with God? The methods of church growing can be done faster than God wants, I'm going to say, by implementing human tactics, manipulation, tantalizing slick marketing, games, entertainment, appealing pulpit messages, like Message, messages that tickle your ears and other nonsense will attract an audience. Puppet shows, now that will really bring them in. I'm just joking. While the numeric growth may rocket forward your numbers and great music, yes, thank you, Larry. The spiritual growth, may I warn you, will be superficial at best and and non-existent at worst. It will be superficial at best and not even existent at worst. And what you're doing is you're robbing the body of Christ from the opportunity of sanctification and maturity spiritually. Seeking numeric growth without spiritual growth, I'm going to just say it, it's a sin. It's a blatant sin in Scripture. It's not godly. God alone receives credit for establishing a new faith, period. So we aren't going to receive credit for numeric growth. We, you're not going to get a big pat on the back from God. Rather, our role as Christ's commandment was to disciple believers, period. I mean, there's no complication there. That's just it. Go and make disciples, all nations. But before, if we fail to fulfill this mission, I'm just going to say this, disobedience to the Lord is also a sin. So as Paul navigates through Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, Luke describes how Paul came to decide where he should turn. Guys, this is so good. How many people are wondering what God wants you to do in your life? 
I know a lot of people are asking that question. Well, this is going to give you some inside tidbits of how to make make sense of this. Guys, let's go 16, 6 through 10. 16, 6 through 10, guys. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, yeah, good but job. the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Tros. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Thank you. What's going on? First off, does anybody see a quick, a very different prefix, a very different um, English? I don't want to give it away. What is it? We, we, there you go. Somebody just got the, the sticker here. We, the, you guys are listening. It's out of place, right? Yes. There we go. So Luke, the word, the person with the pen in his hand is now in the party. It's not a trifecta anymore. It's a quad. And as Paul moves out of Iconium, it seems Paul was intent on moving into the West Asia Minor. If you guys, here's the map. Uh, Asia Minor was on was to the west, this whole thing. And he's wanting to go spread the gospel through the Asia Minor uh, uh, direction, which is in the direction of Ephesus and Laodicea. Okay? But before they could move to these cities, the Holy Spirit forbids that movement. What? <laughs> Sending Paul east. Why? Then Paul reaches Antioch. Why? <laughs> Why did he go all the way over here? Why did he, you know, we got this whole world to tell. Why are we going this way? Why did the Holy Spirit tell us no? And so directly, a little bit more context, directly north lay uh, Berthenia, which is right up here, right here. I don't have a mark here. Is it this little guy? It's, yeah, right here. It's going to be right here where the, the little town you're going to recognize, Nicaea. You guys ever heard of the Nicaean Creed? Nicaea is a world-famous uh, place because of the Nicaean Creed, but, but uh, that is in uh, Bithynia. Nicaea was located right by this little lake right here, actually, it's right there. Um, in Nicaea, from where we received the Nicene Creed, in, in 325 A.D., this is also likely the hiding place where Peter fled after he was let out of Jerusalem's jail. Do you remember this? And he just disappears. Nobody hears from him ever again, and uh, other than folklore or the uh, other than Jewish tradition of him being martyred. We don't hear from Peter again, and it is believed that through rabbinical tradition that he hid out in Nicaea. Can you imagine having having Peter as like a doctrinal backdrop of of uh, deciding whether or not orthodoxy is orthodoxy? Let's talk to Peter. Pretty much horse's mouth, in my opinion. Directly north uh, lay Berthenia, northern Turkey. So this is also uh, the Peter's letter. That it's known to that both of Peter's letters were penned from this region. So while he was in um, Nicaea, Peter pinned First and Second Peter. But again, Paul is prohibited from going north. If you were Paul, wouldn't you like to go hang out with Peter? Like I would have, I would have liked to just go hang out with him. But the Holy Spirit forbid it. We see Paul trying to move west and then north, but having his progress blocked each time. So he's like, Erk. Now what? Oh, okay. The Holy Spirit simply tells Paul, no. No. And each time, Paul had to pick a new direction and then keep moving. What? What would you do if he tells you no? 
I'm going to bet you're going to have a little problem with that. And I would bet that you're not going to keep going. I'm talking to myself a little bit. Okay, I'm talking to myself alone. Have we ever considered, have you ever considered that this is the usual method of operation of the Holy Spirit as He uses this method to guide you in following after the big, the big word here, the Lord's will? How many Christian friends, brothers and sisters come to me and they ask me what the Lord's will is for their life and I say the same thing, I don't know. I don't know. It's devastating to them. They're told from pulpits, they're told from Bible studies, they're told from well-meaning intention, brothers and sisters, that they're living outside of God's will, and they need to hurry up and get back over there. But can I give you a little bit of a, a, a nugget to chew on based upon this? Could it be that the nose are the instrument to God's progression towards His will. Oh man, I don't know if there's a lot of pastors preaching this. I don't know if there's a lot of people who are willing to sacrifice church growth for that big value system it takes to embody as a Christian. I've got to tell you, I've had more no's from the Lord than yeses. And I used to think it was something I'm doing. Have you ever had God tell you, this is what you should do? I've had very few of those. Very rarely do you actually see God say, no, this. You know? It's funny when you start talking to Christians about this because they go, that's me. That's more like it. I thought I was a wacko. I thought I was doing something wrong. Look at this, Paul. We're not talking about some Yahoo, some stranger guy that you never heard of. He wrote the whole, practically all the New Testament. God goes, nope. And yet, Scripture would suggest that the Holy Spirit is more inclined to say no to bad options rather than simply laying out the right option. Isn't he? I think this is interesting. This process makes perfect sense to me when you consider the Spirit's purpose. What is the Spirit's purpose? He wants, he wants us following Jesus. You remember, I don't know if you've ever heard the statement, but following Jesus isn't, isn't a, uh, a one-time decision. It's a fellowship. Fellowship means that you're, it's like following the, the ancient Jews used to follow their rabbi. Exactly the same way he walked. He'd step in his steps, walking through the forest. This is exactly the way Christians are to follow our rabbi, Jesus. Followship. It's not just a brand. It's a followship. The Holy Spirit will always illuminate Christ. And he wants us moving and acting and following after Jesus. He doesn't want us evaluating. Listen to this how right God's plans are. This is not a thing that we must be doing. It's, it's, it's insignificant. It's a waste of time. The Holy Spirit asks us to follow Jesus, and He doesn't want us to obey on a conditional basis, depending on whether or not we like it. Because, guys, I don't know about you, but every time that God asks somebody in Scripture to do something... I'm wondering why the heck did they do it? Let's look at Jonah. The one time God tells Jonah what's going to happen, he goes, eh, no thanks. And he heads off in the, the other direction. I'm Jonah. That'd be me. You know, what did he say to Moses? Go to, is go to Egypt and say this, 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 this. No, he didn't say everything he was supposed to say. He said, you go then I'll tell you what to say, and I will be the words in your mouth. If he would have explained everything that he's going to say, there's all these plagues and everybody's going to die and all these firstborn, what do you think Moses is going to do? Check, please. I think it's interesting. So the better approach is to encourage us to move out and then teach us to see the world and our choices and priorities from the Lord's point of view. With each turn, we learn God's perspective more clearly. 
don't we? We start understanding who he is and less about us. More him, less us. I think of it like a game of pin the tail on the donkey. Ever do that? We're blind to God's purposes. Come on, we are. I mean, do you know the depths of God's purposes? We are let this much of God's incredible salvation plan. And we actually it said we know more than the angels do. We see Jesus come to take us, uh, take our place on the cross. We have a glimpse of the sacred salvation plan from the foundations of our globe. And we're blind to God's ultimate purpose, at least at first. But as we move, the Holy Spirit is guiding us with hints of, this is what we used to play, you're getting hotter. We're getting colder. Now you're getting really cold. Oh, hot. Oh, you're, you're red hot. Oh, you're red hot. And as we see the pattern, we get better and working our way to God's intended target. This is an incredible insight. Where am I pulling this? I'm pulling this from Paul's journeys. This is a slower, more error-prone process for God. Why would, it, why would he even do this with us? Why would he choose to use us? But here's the clincher. It brings him glory. In the way your weak vessel, my weak vessel, testifies to his power through our weakness. In Paul's case, we don't know how the Spirit communicated these prohibitions to Paul, but I assume it was the same way the Spirit communicates to us. A feeling, a sense, a door, slam, closed, open. Our planning sh just shattered. The plane not landing, the taxi not showing up. Reading our circumstances and feeling a peace or hesitation in our heart, we discern the Lord's leading, don't we? It's not indifferent. It's not any different than this. And so Paul moves the only direction he can, west towards Troas on the Aegean, Aegean Sea. And this, uh, as some people call it, the Aegean Sea. And this was God's purpose. For the Lord's desire to expose an entirely new region of the gospel, Macedonia, right here. That's what God wanted to do. You know, we're going to Europe. Yeah, exactly. Notice in verse 10, the Luke uses the pronoun us for the first time. From this point forward, Luke will say we or us for the rest of the book. This tells us that Luke was likely Paul's companion or convert from Troas. So we can know that the Dr. Luke was introduced to the gospel through the Apostle Paul. And at this point, Luke joins Paul, Paul's growing traveling party. From his exposure to Paul, Luke not only writes the book of Acts, but he also pins the Gospels, the Gospel of Luke. He accounts for 25% of the New Testament's content. And he was likely a Gentile. Crazy, right? Somebody read 11 through 15. We're getting down to the end. 11 through 15. So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Thermopolis, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we were supposed to where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyra, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful, come <laughs> to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Hey, you are gifted. Thank you. As Paul responds immediately to the Spirit's direction, we begin a new section in the book that takes us all the way to chapter 19. We're going to see a number of important developments in this next section. Paul's going to advance the gospel in the three major regions of the Greek civilization, namely Macedonia, 
Achaia, and eventually Asia. And each area is dominated by a respective capital city. Guess what these capital cities are named? You guys might understand and recognize these ones. Thessalonica, Ephesus, and Corinth. Each city brings, uh, being preserved in the canon of Scripture by their respective letters, uh, these letters to the Thessalonians will be written during the trip while Paul stays in Corinth. You'll see that later on. Many scholars remark that Paul's work to plant churches in these major centers of Western civilization represented his greatest achievement. Because think about it. These are the most Greek of Greek of Greek Gentile cities in the world. You just waltz into town and start churches in the, the most fallen church uh, cities in the world? Yes. These cities were regions covered, uh, they covered the northern, western, and eastern coast of the uh, GNC. And together they represented a cradle of western civilization of the day. They controlled thought. They controlled philosophy. We get so much from this little group of towns from our historical uh, antiquity. In fact, we would consider the events of Acts 11 through 19 represent only five years of Paul's life. Five years of ministry led to the entire nation of Europe to essentially to hear the gospel. That's pretty hard to beat. If you had five-year plan for your ministry, this is your gold standard against which you would measure your progress. If any of you guys are staffers uh, at a church and you got you're planning out your next year, just take it after uh, take it after Paul. <laughs> on the way to Macedonia, Paul makes a stop on an island called Samothrace and then on to Neapolis, and then finally Philippi. Philippi is the capital city of one of our of the four Roman districts of the Macedonian region. Philippi, you guys remember that. Luke says that Paul waited a few days before beginning their ministry. This was because the city's Jewish population was so small that it didn't even have a synagogue. And what's Jewish's, what's his regular MO? Jews first, right? So he had to wait for the Sabbath for all the Jews to come out of their homes. So he's like, let's hang out here till the Sabbath so I can preach to the Jews. So Paul has always began with the Jews. So Jewish customs require at least 10 men age 13 or older in a given city before a synagogue could be established. So it's saying, it's supposed that there wasn't even 10 Jewish men in that town. So if a town lacked that many male Jews, the Jewish custom required that the Jews present a congregant, congregation in an open area, preferably near a riverside, so they could drink. So if you didn't have a synagogue, you're too poor, you went, river, you went and uh, met at the sandbar next to the river. There they find women in observant, observance of the day of the Lord, the Sabbath. This makes sense since if only 10 men were available, a synagogue would have, would have not been in operation. So as Paul spoke to these three women, these women, Lydia, was given the ability to... to <laughs> check this out, I love this. This one woman was given the ability to hear the gospel. Did you see that? She had God give her that ability. That's a very, a very interesting, very important thing. Notice in passing the emphasis in Luke's narrative on God's sovereignty and salvation. Clearly, the actor in the play here is God himself. It's not so much about Lydia, is it? Lydia becomes the first European convert to Christianity. It's a woman. Isn't that awesome? I think that's incredible. It, and, and interesting that Paul was drawn to Macedonia by a dream of a man in Macedonia. But the first convert was a woman. Huh. Was she the man in the dream? Huh. It's also notable that she was a seller of purple dyes. Huh. Purple was the most difficult dye color to obtain since neutral colors in that, in that era were super rare. The sources for that would be super rare. Purple was a part of royal dress for this reason. And the most common location of purple fabric production was Thyatira, which is mentioned in the first two chapters of Revelation. And it's actually a pre it's a It's a Christophany, and it's a complete prophetic meaning that's found in the first two chapters of Revelation, which I think is non-coincidental. Uh, Lydia hailed from Thyatira, so she knew how to make purple dye. Th uh, Lydia was likely a successful businesswoman in her day, and she was also a woman who worshipped God. This means that she believed 
she believes she's Jewish and at least a God-fearing Gentile, believing in the promised Jewish Messiah. So her eyes were on eternity. She's looking for the Messiah, the promised one. And as a result, her conversion, she was baptized along with her household, probably right there in that river. Perfect, right? And she offered an apostle the, the encouragement and the hosting of a place to stay. Last but not least, verse 16 through 18, I'll read it. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very moment. Later, we, got, we, got, we see this. Paul is returning to the place of prayer, probably because his earlier trip had re resulted in numerous women becoming Christians. And now Paul has made a routine of going to this place to minister to these early believers. On the way there, this slave girl joined behind him as he's walking, and she starts yelling. And Luke uses the word python because of a Greek mythology at the time, a python spirit. In the original text, she's not just demonic, she has a python spirit. Why does he say that? The literal meaning is a python spirit. The reference to a snake reminds us that Satan in the garden and tells us that it's a demonic spirit. Luke uses that for a specific reason. The belief at the time was that the girl was occupied by a Greek god named Apollo. It was an honor to be possessed by this god. And it would give the individual the ability to tell your future. Sound familiar? It's still going on today. And this uh, this python spirit was a serpent that guarded the Delphinic Oracle. I, you guys are <laughs> totally thinking I'm a nerd now, but the Delphinic Oracle, <laughs> yeah, just now, uh, thank you. And uh, in Greek mythology, this snake guarded the oracle that was, and he was killed by Apollos, um, who then obtained the oracle's power for himself. Later, all diviners came to be known as pythons. Like we call them palm readers. We call them psychics. Well, their original name was snakes, pythons. So this girl is indwelled by a spirit that can speak prophetically, but we know this spirit is not one of Greek mythology, but it is demonic. Greeks call them, you know, mythology. We know them to be fallen angels. All occult practices and beliefs, including those of ancient civilizations, trace their power back to Satan, whether they realize it or not. Period. I don't apologize for that statement. This is a sorcery or divination that the Bible warns against, and this is what Paul does. As we learn next, unscrupulous men had discovered this slave girl's demonic power and had trapped her in a money-making enterprise of fortune-telling, making big bucks. And the girl declares publicly that Paul is preaching the true gospel. What? The announcing continues for several days, and we can assume it helped draw crowds to Paul's message. Finally, Paul becomes so annoyed by it all and cast the demon out of the girl. This passage raises two immediate questions, and then I'm going to draw this to a close because we're almost out of time. Number one, why does this demon-possessed girl proclaim the God-glorifying truth? Is, is, how is she even capable of that? Wouldn't the demon want to do anything but glorify God? Here's the answer. <laughs> is that God will use everything in His creation. Everything in His creation to bring Himself glory. The demon inside the woman could no more resist God's will than you and me. Period. He's a sovereign God. Demons aren't stronger than God. Remember Balaam in Numbers 22? He is intent on cursing Israel, but ends up opening over his mouth and blessing Israel. God just doesn't let him, but uses his words. Other patriarchs who tried to bless the wrong child against God's wishes didn't get her done. Or Satan himself, who, is, who indwelt Judas and brought Jesus to the cross, only to learn that that was God's purpose too. So God had directed the, the demon to act in this way to suit God's purposes, 
in Paul's ministry. Did you know that's possible? This also goes to prove that James says what James says concerning demons. They know they know the loving God and they know Jesus, but they do not have a God-given capacity to follow and or worship God. They don't have a plan of redemption. They don't have a gospel message. We do. As Hebrews says, God does not give help to angels, meaning demons. He does not give them a salvation plan. They've already done their thing. They've made their decision. This leads us to the second question. Why does Paul tolerate the girl's outburst for a time and then changes his mind and run the demon out of the girl later? Why? Why didn't he just do it right then? The text says Paul was annoyed, or in the Greek, worn out. At some point, the woman stopped being an advantage to Paul's ministry and started becoming a hindrance. Before Paul's message in the city was widely heard and understood, the heralding was helping Paul's mission. Eventually, Paul doesn't want, doesn't want the truth of God's word to compete with the cessationalism and proclamations of the sideshow. Plus, the woman is associated with pagan religious power and belief, so associating too closely with her begins to complicate Paul's message. And of course, Paul was human, and the prospect of a woman screaming the announcement over and over again would have driven a guy crazy, right? The lesson is that while the gospel can be introduced through sensationalism, a cessational attention-grabbing means the long-term growth of the gospel cannot, and I'll say it again, cannot depend upon it. The growth of the church is dependent on the Word of God and the saving work of the Spirit. <laughs> period. This story is sandwiched between the quiet saving moment of Lydia on the riverbank. You know, the sweet little Lydia on the riverbank and a remarkable story of a jailer's salvation in the second half of the chapter. And I hope you guys come back next week. It would seem Luke has linked these two events to show the miracles and the sideshow are merely yah yah compared to the real mover and shaker, the Holy Spirit, and this thing, the Word of God. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for this time with our brothers and sisters to look into exactly what you have for us. We give you praise and adoration for what you're doing in our lives, and we give you praise for giving us the Word. And we look forward to meeting back here and looking what's in the second half of chapter 16. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a great week.